The war in Bosnia-Herzegovina may have ended 15 years ago, but for many of the nation's women, the legacy of wartime rape lives on. Now, after years on the run, Bosnia's two remaining indicted war crime fugitives have finally been captured. But the question remains, can the wounds of war ever really be healed? Join us on one woman's emotional journey to confront her past and change her future. Nestled in the hills of Bosnia, amid the bucolic scenery and tranquil life, lies Foča, a town with a dark and troubled past. It was April 1992. In a campaign of ethnic cleansing, Serb forces moved to seize land they claimed was theirs, killing mainly Muslims and Croats who opposed. I can still hear the walls crying out to the echoes of mothers and children pleading and begging not to be taken. What happened to this woman? Unisa Salcinovic is the story of pain, loss, and memories so horrific they last a lifetime. The story of how the trauma of war can haunt its victims long after the brutality has stopped. Anissa grew up in Foča, spending summer days by the river. Those were the most beautiful childhood days. Growing up carefree. She studied social work, learned to dance and fell in love with a childhood friend. They married and had two daughters. He was a really beautiful person. This was a man who laughed day and night. Someone who never in his life was angry. He was so happy. And so was she. She had family, friends and a job she loved at this hospital. When these photos were taken, I could never have imagined the catastrophe that was about to happen. Neither could her husband, who was certain his multi-ethnic town of Foča, where people lived together peacefully as neighbors, would be immune to the violence sweeping other parts of Bosnia. No, no, he said, we won't flee. This is our Foča. But on April the 8th, the shelling and the shooting started. Neighbor turned on neighbor, and Unisa's perfect world fell apart. Her husband volunteered to take to the streets to defend the town they loved, while she and her daughters sought sanctuary in the hospital. We had one desire, to save the children. We all paced and cried and thought, how do we flee? We were all terrified. Ten days later came the news she'd feared. Her husband was captured, held with hundreds of other men in Foch's prison, now in the hands of the enemy. A month later, she got to see him. They were given only five minutes. When I saw him in the hall, he was no longer the same man. He had lost nearly half his body weight. He whispered in my ear for me to escape the town. He leaned in to tell me that and to kiss the children. Then the warden told him to step away from us, and the warden turned to watch on the clock exactly five minutes. She was then forced to leave. That was the last time we saw him. Meanwhile, other terrible things were happening in Foča. Women and girls, mostly Muslim, some as young as 12, were being rounded up and imprisoned in houses in the hills, like this one, where they were often gang-raped and tortured. Hundreds of others were detained here, at Partizan, a sports hall before the war, Partizan now became a kind of makeshift rape camp, a place that soldiers came day and night to pick their prey. As for Anissa and her children, they were now taking cover here in this apartment building. 
on Ailiepi balcon. That beautiful balcony on the top was the apartment of my parents. But there was no safety here. A man who worked with my husband came and raped me for the first time. Her husband's former colleague, now a Serb soldier, came to the apartment routinely, often raping her with her parents in the next room. It is a spiritual pain. Those are your parents. Those are your children. And they know what's happening. That was so shameful. It's a shame I cannot bear. But things only got worse. One day the soldier came and she was out, searching for food for her children. That's when he found me and he took me to Partizan and he left me there. He told me he'd be back. What she saw and heard inside these walls still torments her. The cries of victims being dragged away sometimes by a dozen or more soldiers, others being raped right there. Anissa's attacker returned for her one night, joined by his brother who was carrying a rifle. The brother was a colleague of Anissa's from the hospital and he recognized her. <laughs> With the butt of his rifle, he pushed me all the way down to the exit door. What he did next, she says, was a miracle. He leaned and said, I owe you this. Morally, I do. You always helped me before the war. Then he told her to run. She fled under the cover of darkness. Anissa and her daughters joined others and made it across the border to Montenegro in mid-August 1992. For the next seven years, they lived as refugees until finally being resettled in Bosnia's capital city of Sarajevo. Today, they live in a two-room apartment. Anissa sleeps in the kitchen. That's where I sleep. And this is my space for cooking. It's a world away, she says, from where she grew up. Most of Focha's inhabitants now are Bosnian Serbs. The majority of Muslims, like Anissa, have chosen not to return. Partizan is once again a sports hall. Inside, the workers are busy repainting. Anissa has never been back inside Partizan until today, 18 years to the day since she escaped. <laughs> This door to this building was the door to hell. That horror that humans can inflict. It's unimaginable. The agony we women suffered. It's too much to believe. She's come, she says, not just for her, but for the many women who can no longer be heard. Through that door, they brought them in and out. And here there were mats laid out. Here there were hundreds of women. the memories come flooding back. Every day and every night, women were taken. Some never returned. The fear was so great, she says, even the children were too afraid to cry. Here, people died of starvation as well only able to eat what little crumbs were left over from the soldiers. How is it possible for people to play table tennis here today? 
They're repainting so no one else can see what they did to us. They can't cover that up. Victims of sexual torture very often develop post-traumatic stress disorder, which is chronic. Psychiatrist Dubravka Salcic is founder of Bosnia Center of Rehabilitation of Torture Victims. People are suffering. They feel shame, guilty. They have nightmares. They have also flashback. The process of recovery is very painful and very slow. There are an estimated 20,000 wartime rape victims of all ethnic groups across Bosnia. Some 80% of them still experience psychological and physical symptoms. They need a very complex uh, and very comprehensive treatment and rehabilitation. And this means the need for more therapy centers, more clinicians and greater access to doctors in the hard to reach areas, she says. But even 15 years after peace, securing this has been a challenge, contends Celia Judarea, Bosnia and Herzegovina's Assistant Minister of Human Rights and Refugees. A country, she says, is still in transition. We had various laws, various changes of power, various problems that always pushed the victims aside. Their problems haven't gone away because it had, time has passed. They relive their traumas every day. Faris Hadrovic, head of the United Nations Population Fund in Bosnia and Herzegovina, says that providing the necessary rehabilitation must be a high priority for the government. They owe it to the victims. The victims, they want to walk with their heads high, you know, proud, regardless of the fact that this is what they've gone through. Some wartime rape victims finally did become eligible for financial compensation in 2008. But many like Unisa, who receives 350 US dollars a month, worry it's not always going to cover the needed therapy and medication. Those are one, two, three, four, five, plus the other one. That's six different medications I take daily. Unisa is now working as a housekeeper and a cook to make ends meet. Keeping busy helps, she says. So does being there for others. She's founded a survivors group with some 2,000 members from all over Bosnia, each with her own story. For these women, the group has become a kind of informal therapy. They meet to sew, to talk, to cry. As for the question of securing justice, cases of rape in Focha were tried here at the UN's International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The Focha trials made history, marking the first time an international tribunal prosecuted sexual enslavement as a crime against humanity. The trial began on March 20, 2000. May we have the parties, please? The, the accused, Dragolub Kunarats, Radomir Kovac, Radomir Kovac and Zoran Vukovic, all former Bosnian Serb fighters. Judge Florence Mumba. The three accused, who are ethnic Serbs, have been charged by the prosecution with violations of the laws and customs of war and with crimes against humanity. The prosecution opened. This is a case about rape camps in eastern Bosnia whose uncovering in 1992 shocked the world. This is a case about the women and girls, some as young as 12 or 15 years old, who endured unimaginable horrors as the worlds collapsed around them. The trial lasted eight months. Some 160 exhibits were presented. More than 60 witnesses testified. The verdicts were finally announced in February 2001. Will the accused Dragoyu Kunaras please stand? The trial chamber does not accept your defense of alibi. The trial chamber therefore finds you guilty. Also found guilty were Radomir Kovac and Zoran Vukovic. What the evidence shows is that the rapes were used by members of the Bosnian Serb Armed Forces as an instrument of terror. The men were sentenced to jail terms of up to 28 years. 
And while such verdicts bring some solace, Nanisa says that she will never really heal until she can bury her husband. She heard that he was shot, his body thrown into the river she played in as a little girl. His bones, together with those of hundreds of other people in Focha, have never been found. I need to bury him. You can't imagine. Even the smallest bone to hold, to put in a casket to bury. Somewhere where I can leave flowers with my children. Her daughters, who she asked not to be filmed, are now in their 20s, both college graduates. Their father, Anissa says, would be proud. As for her, she finds comfort where she can from the 11 family photos she managed to save from the war, now tucked safely in her purse, and the flowers she keeps on her small balcony, reminders of the beauty of the focha she once knew. No matter how hard they tried to kill everything within us, within me, they killed nothing. I will not stumble. As long as I can walk, I will persevere. I will find the strength within me.